In 2004, Hillcrest Labs created a new TV experience. Known today as the Smart TV, Hillcrest defined a holistic system design that included the remote control, human interaction, and the user interface that would provide access to the huge array of content available on TV today. The remote control, known as the loop, revolutionized the device, eliminating dozens of buttons and simplifying the interaction to just a few, a scroll wheel, and the ability to use in-air motion technology called free space to point at objects on the screen. The user interface was called Home, and it also revolutionized the TV experience by using the pointer-based remote to create a new paradigm for interactive TV. The original Home was developed in Java on a PC to test many of the design concepts and interactions and was actually used not only in test labs, but in people's homes. Presented here with narration by Hillcrest founder and CEO Dan Simpkins is the original home interface. The design concepts and implementations provide a unique insight into the early days of interactive TV as well as highlight opportunities for new user experiences in the living room today. The idea of this interface um, really centers on a cursor control and a set of uh, essentially a visual or, or graphical environment that is controlled by, um, by the cursor, all designed for television. So I think the, the cornerstone, the thing that makes the, this platform differ from other platforms that exist, it's not a smartphone that was turned into a TV interface, it's not a tablet. This was designed from scratch to be implemented for television. There are large icons that represent the applications. Um, there's the notion of hover as the motion controller moves the cursor over the icon. The um, icon hovers to tell you that that's actually something that can be um, implemented. One of the other things that's interesting is if I let the motion controller go still, I put it on the table, that the cursor goes away because I uh, would assume that I'm watching something live, assuming this homepage might have some live video on it, and I don't want to be encumbered by the cursor, um, the visual of the cursor. I haven't talked about earlier, uh, talked about yet the cursor itself. Why is the cursor round? Why is it round with a little arrow? Um, well, one of the problems with a PC cursor where you're only uh, two feet away is that the PC cursor as an arrow is a fairly thin line and isn't necessarily easy to see. We wanted an object that would have a lot of mass um, but wouldn't take up an enormous amount of space on the screen and the object or the, the, geograph or the geometry that is best for that is actually a circle. It has the greatest number of pixels for the um, for a given diameter, or a given um, width or, or length of the object. Um, but a circle by itself, and we've actually had some folks think about, well, why don't I just use a cursor or a bullseye as the object? Well, you need to at least let the user know what is the um, point of control. And so the arrow gives you that point of control. When the arrow reaches um, an object, it, it's the tip of the arrow that's driving um, the essentially the, the correlation between the cursor and the, uh, the GUI. All right, so let's also look at our interface from a, another uh, perspective of TV. We wanted this interface to, to move. So as I, I move, a lot of GUIs would highlight this object and it would just turn it you know, from silver to blue, for example. Um, but television is about movement, it's about video. And so wherever possible, wherever we could actually create movement, um, we, we included movement. So not only do I hover to indicate that I could go into on-demand, but then when I implement, um, when I click on on-demand, I zoom into that application. Now zooming actually has two components to it as well. Um, not only does it create the motion of television, um, so it gives the, the sense that what, there's a dynamic experience here, but that motion, that zooming, also reflects the idea of a spatial interface, like zooming into a map. And um, it's been proven through um, a number of cognitive studies that if you give people um, landmarks that are, um, that are essentially guideposts on a journey, 
that is a logical journey that they remember that path better than if you just snap to um, a particular point in um, in an interface. And so we've created this idea of zooming into content as opposed to just snapping to that content. I use an analogy when I explain this. Um, the analogy is that you get in the car to go to to um, to go on a trip, and uh, you're somebody's driving the car and you're the passenger. Um, and what we've done is we put a blindfold on you, and we only take the blindfold off at the street corners. I um, mean, when you get to the location where you're going, you we ask, so do you know how you got here? And virtually no one um, has a good enough inner ear, a good enough navigational uh, skill to, to essentially track, um, track where they've been. We typically as humans use both our, our ear and our our inner ears navigation system with our visual cue to know where we're going. And so what we did in this interface is use those visual cues. We zoom into content, we pan over with motion to enable uh, the, cons the user to really keep track visually of where they are. So here we are, um, uh, we've zoomed into our on-demand application and another critical component of our experience is that it's highly visual. Whereas the typical interface that existed previously had a lot of text, a list of text um, to tell you what movies were available. Our view was that a picture is worth a thousand words. That by using pictures, we would um, be able to allow the user to, to uh, find more content in this case, to browse more content. And that brings up um, a concept that was first illustrated to us by Stephanie Otto at Brainstorm. Stephanie had coined the term fine grays browse, that consumers who know what they want and want to go to a search and type in a search, those consumers are finding content. They know that they want to watch the latest episode of, um, of Glee, and they type in Glee and go find it. Um, but other consumers don't really know what they want, and they need to graze. And what grazing is, is just really like the meadow, the sheep in the meadow. Um, they know basically that they want an action movie, and they want to be able to then graze or um, look for content within that category. Um, and it, we've essentially refined our search to, um, to a limited degree, um, but still have made the outcome open-ended. And finally, there's the idea of browse, where you don't know what you want. And in the TV, the classical TV environment, browse is a lot about channel surfing. Um, I go to channel two, and then three, and then four, and I ultimately find some video that looks interesting, and I stop, um, and I start watching. Now, most guys never stop. They just keep surfing. Um, but, um, but this idea of browse gives you the capability, uh, effectively the, the, the technical framework to access and be presented with large amounts of content. Here on this video on demand screen, um, we have over 100 movies represented. And you might say to yourself, well, I can't detect, um, I can't really detect what it is I want to watch from the screen. But you kind of, you, you can almost uh, subconsciously. The action movies are darker. There's flames and there's guys holding guns um, and action figures. Um, in, the, um, in other categories like family, there are bright colors. And again, there's um, characters that you might recognize um, as well. But the, the color scheme and the structure of these covers is different. And so this visual interface was designed around the idea of visual assets, visual metadata associated with this content that would be used to do a first level, um, essentially a first level detection of what's interesting. Um, if I want to go into a classic and I, I recognize the movie High Moon, a uh, High Noon, I could, again, I could zoom in and I get more information. And now I do get textual information. I get the title, I get a date, I get a description and some other selections. And it gives me a really easy way to go and click on a preview or watch that movie. And, and it also, of course, gives me the rating. 
And so I've now been presented with this content, but the beauty of a dynamic interface, an, an interactive interface, is that I should have the ability to use the information presented to me to go in other places. Now, in this interface, the information has been editorially crafted. So I look at recommendations of other content. And when I see something that's interesting, I could leave the interface and notice that I zoom up and over like a helicopter hovering. That's a very important one. But I could hit the right mouse button and go right back. I could put the car in reverse and back up. And by the way, I could continue to do that. And I could trace my steps through this interface. And again, not only can I go forward using a spatial interface, I could go back the same way. So when I get into a particular piece of content that's interesting, Spider-Man, I would love to watch it. I didn't see the original when it came out. Great. It's a good movie. It's rated PG-13. It's fine to watch. I think I'll do, have the whole family watch. Um, but my wife sits down and says, you know, Spider-Man, can't we watch a chick flick for a change? So we go in and we look at the recommendations. Um, and actually, we see not only recommendations via the editorial source, um, the content provider themselves or the service provider, but there's actually a second level of, um, of recommendation. We can look at content that might be in this library um, through some of the key actors. So um, we could go to Willem Dafoe and find out that indeed we love Willem Dafoe and there are other movies on the site that um, Dafoe has, has, um, is in. And what's interesting is notice these hovers. So these are active links. I can select a piece of content from that recommendation um, uh, screen. But I could go back and we'll go back and we could do the same thing from recommended. It turns out because of Willem Dafoe, um, English Patient is also a recommended movie. Again, active content, zoom up and zoom over. Now, I want to take a step back and, and look at this structure of the screen as well. Um, this is television. I don't want a lot of content. This is not the web. I don't want a lot of noise. So what I really like is this notion of a tab. These tabs are important to create a more sophisticated screen. I could have put all this content on the screen at once. Notice there's a lot of white space. There's a lot of area around this information screen that's not being used. It's not being used on purpose because I want to sit back. I'm operating from 10 feet away from my couch. I have big fonts. I have big imagery now so that I could see it from 10 feet away and I can control it using my motion interface and I don't get overwhelmed by the content. When I see a piece of content, I'm at the English patient, my daughter walks in the room and says, Dad, I can't watch that, it's rated R. I say, great, you know what, let's watch a family film. We haven't seen Finding Nemo and I could zoom over to that. So you see this idea of this very fluid, dynamic experience using these spatial cues all being controlled by a cursor on screen. No up, down, left, right. I don't, I have a lot of selections that I've made, but it's been a seamless process of starting out at high level in a browse, zooming into a screen, an action screen for grays, looking at recommendations to take me outside of that category into other categories, and ultimately flow um, to this movie. Now, one other thing in this recommendation process is you're not constrained to just movies. You don't have to, why movies? We don't see ourselves as sitting down to necessarily watch a movie, maybe we are, but what we really want is to be entertained. And at the point in time when we ultimately decide that we're gonna consume some content, we might be interested in consuming a different form of content. In this case, we've actually linked in a, a soundtrack. And I'm gonna click on that soundtrack and I've actually spatially gone up and over and flown over to the music app. And now I actually have a, um, a CD or an album or a virtual representation of this music. I can click on a song and I can play that song um, or frankly, I could decide, you know what? I don't wanna play that song. I wanna go back and actually watch the movie.